Getting the Word Out to Sinners The Evolution of Seventh-day Adventist Publishing Ellen White was given light that helped to explain their difficulty and opened the way for the study to continue. The visions also placed the stamp of God's approval upon correct conclusions. Thus the prophetic gift acted as a corrector of error and a confirmer of truth. The brethren were studying and praying concerning their responsibility to herald the light that the Lord had caused to shine upon their pathway. As they studied, Ellen White was off in vision, and in this revelation she was shown the duty of the brethren to publish this light. After coming out of vision, I said to my husband, I have a message for you. You must begin to print a little paper and send it out to the people. Let it be small at first, but as the people read, they will send you means with which to print, and it will be a success from the first. Here was a call to action. What could James White do? He had little of this world's goods. But the vision was a divine directive, and he felt the compulsion to move forward by faith. So with his 75-cent Bible and concordance with both covers torn off, James White began to prepare the articles on the Sabbath truth and other kindred topics to be printed in a little paper. The type was set, the proofs were read, and 1,000 copies of the paper were printed. James White transported them from the Middletown printing office, to the Belden home where he and Ellen had found a temporary refuge. The little sheet was 6 by 9 inches in size, and contained 8 pages. It bore the title The Present Truth. Thus the publishing work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church began. The date was July, 1849. The little pile of papers was laid upon the floor. Then the brethren and sisters gathered about them, and with tears in their eyes, pleaded with God to bless the little sheet as it should be sent out. Then the papers were folded, wrapped and addressed, and James White carried them eight miles to the Middletown Post Office. Thus the publishing work of the Seventh-day Adventist Church began. Four issues were sent out in this manner, and each was prayed over before the papers were taken to the post office. Soon letters were received, telling of people who had begun to keep the Sabbath from reading the papers. As James and Ellen White traveled from place to place, staying a few months here and a few months there, they arranged for the publishing of a few issues of the paper. Finally the eleventh and last issue was published at Paris, Maine, in November, 1850. Mrs. White contributed several articles to the present truth. Also in November, a conference was held in Paris, and the brethren gave study to the growing publishing work. They decided to enlarge the paper, and they changed its name to the Second Advent Review and Sabbath Herald. In the spring of 1852, the Whites moved to Rochester, New York, and there established an office in which they could do their own printing. How happy the early believers were when our papers could be issued on a Sabbath-keeping press. For a little more than three years, they lived in Rochester and published the message there. In addition to the Review and Herald and the Youth's Instructor begun by James White in 1852, they also, from time to time, published tracts. Mrs. White's second pamphlet, Supplement to the Christian Experience and Views of Ellen G. White, was published in Rochester in January 1854. In November 1855, James and Ellen White and their helpers moved to Battle Creek, Michigan. The press and other pieces of printing equipment were placed in a building erected by several of the Sabbath-keeping Adventists who had furnished the money with which to establish their own printing office. As their work developed in that little city, Battle Creek became the natural headquarters of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. But it was with difficulty that James White maintained the publishing work. As we study the background of early writings, it should be noted that the early Sabbath-keeping Adventists at first had a burden to reach with the Sabbath truth. Only their former brethren in the Great Advent Awakening, that is, those who had been with them in the first and the second angel's messages. Consequently for about seven years after 1844, 
Their labors were very largely for Adventists who had not yet taken their stand on the third angel's message. To one familiar with the circumstances, this is understandable, 